Michael, thank you so much for joining us for Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted. I think we first met in the uh, restroom at a conference centre. Yes, I, I was talking to you and I was so anxious to ask you questions that I, I followed you in. That's right. And you looked a bit nervous while I, I stood next to you, while I kept asking you questions. Yes. And then that, I followed you back out again. That's right, you did. And yes. that was back in... And then you called security. No, <laughs> um, that was 1992. Two, yes. So you were still a student then? I was still a student. Uh, were you doing a PhD at that time? No, I was doing a law degree, and um, it was a conference about evangelism. That's right. And I was, I'd come to England, having been raised a lot of my life outside of the UK and also in the Middle East. And when I became a Christian, no one explained to me you couldn't do evangelism in, in Europe. So when I arrived, I just thought, well, I should get about telling people about Jesus. And um, that came to the attention of a few other people. And then they said, there's a conference that you want to love it, filled yes. with evangelists, come along. And that's where I got to meet you. That's right. And then we had dinner with yourself and your lovely wife. And your wife too. Yes, that's right. A few years after that. And then we just stayed in touch. We stayed in touch. You're, you're an apologist. What does that mean? Well, what it doesn't mean is that you go around telling people about Jesus and then saying, sorry, I had to do that, but it's part of the package. <laughs> right. That's good. Um, the easiest way to explain it, because it's actually a Greek word, and what happens when they were translating the Bible, they came across this word, apologia, and instead of translating it, they just took the Greek word and put an anglicised ending on the end and created a new word, apologetic. So an apologist is someone who, when someone says, well, why do you believe that? You, you say, well, here is why. And in that sense, in the broadest term, every Christian at some point is going to be an apologist. Yes. At some point, someone's going to ask you why. And whatever you say in answer to that question, that's your apologetic. That's that is the reason why. And you've been doing that for how long? Wow. Well, I was raised in a non-Christian culture, in a non-Christian setting. And when I became a Christian... And that was in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And then when yes. I became a Christian when I was 17 and a half, someone gave me a stack of tapes by a guy called Ravi Zacharias. Now, you moved from Saudi Arabia, Arabia to, to Cyprus. Cyprus. Yeah. And, and I got all these tapes. And I, and I went along to an Anglican cathedral. So you weren't a Christian then? No. Yeah. What did came... you call yourself? Uh, uh, disinterested. Right. I think. Disinterested. Yeah. yeah I, I, in the Middle East, you see a lot of abuse of religious power. That sort of puts you off a yes. little bit. Um, but I wasn't angry about it. It just wasn't, it wasn't for me, and it seemed to be a bad thing for society, as far as I was concerned. It was a bad thing. And then I met some Christians, and they were different from other religious people I met. They, they were alive in a way that, that I hadn't really seen in other people. That got me interested. Um, Someone said, said to me after I moved to Cyprus, you should get young people together to talk about these questions. And I thought, that's a brilliant idea. Who should I get? And they suggested someone to me, the area director for Youth for Christ had just come. So I went to the, to the country to base the Middle East part of their ministry from there. And I went to him and I said, we should have a youth group to talk about these things. He assumed I was a Christian. Yes. Anyway, he organised it. I brought my friends. He realised none of us were Christians. And we realised that he was. And this was going to be a Christian group. But he was quite interesting, and you know, there was something different about his life. We brought more and more friends, got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then after nine months, he said, I want to go take you away for a weekend, but the government won't allow it. And I said, no, that's no problem. We have connections. What's yes. the problem? They said, well, you need permission from the chief of police and from the minister for interior. So I went home and asked my mother, do you know the chief of police? And she said, I do know the chief of police. She said, when I was at school, he asked me to go out with him. And your Uncle George knocked out his two front teeth. So if he ever came near me again, he would kill him. Yes. I said, well, can you ring him? So she rings him. Ten minutes later, OK, you've got permission from the chief of police. I said, well, I also need permission from the government, from the Minister for Interior, to release this campsite and allow us to use it. I said, do you know him? She said, of course we know him. So she rings him up. We get permission from the Minister for Interior. We organise the camp. We plan the camp. I go up to the camp. And on the second day of that camp, I became a Christian. So I actually planned and organised my own conversion. Your own conversion. <laughs> yeah. So what happened the second day? What was it that, that crystallised? That, what was your epiphany? Wow. Well, when I went away on that camp, I suddenly realised that after nine months, I believed the Christian faith was true and real. I believed it was completely true. And that it also, if you like, transformed lives. It actually changed people, because I could see all these changed people around me. 
And I suddenly realized I didn't want it to be true. And I didn't want it to be true because I was actually enjoying my life. I was pretty happy. Things were going well. You know, I was a good student at school. I was popular. Heavy smoker. I was a heavy smoker. Um, that is true. But I was also captain of the basketball team and captain of the swimming team and captain of the tennis team and captain of the chess team and of the debating society. And so everything seems to be going really, really well. And I, and I thought, if I become a Christian, my enjoyment of life, which is way up here, is going to drop to down here. And I, I didn't want to be unhappy. And why, why did you have that perception that that would happen? You Who know, gave you that? I think, I think maybe, I don't, know, from the, I don't know if it was just from the media or, or, or what it may be, but the impression was, you know, I'd seen the Mr. Bean, you know, goes to church. Thing. Yes. That's one thing I had seen. And it didn't, and I had been to church occasionally. And I can remember, you know, in the Anglican Cathedral, a guy standing at the front saying, my heart is full and my cup overfloweth joy to the Lord. And I didn't believe him, basically, because no. the, uh, the, no. the joy wasn't visible. No, the joy and, was so deep, you couldn't dig it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that was the problem. And, and, you know, and as, you, as other people have said, you know, people sing that song, there's a joy, joy, joy deep down in my heart, and everyone says, where? Yeah. <laughs> you know, deep down in my heart, where? Because they can't see it. So, yeah. um, so I think there was that. And what I hadn't realised was the people I was talking to who I was so attracted to, yes. I didn't think I was going to become like them. I thought I might become like one of these guys over here. And so I did. I, I, I was wrestling on the second day of this camp I had this talk and I said, look, imagine that life is like a swimming pool and I'm in the shallow end of the pool of life and all my friends are there and I'm really enjoying myself. And by asking me to become a Christian, you're asking me to get out of the pool, walk along the edge, jump into the deep end. I don't even know if I can swim. Maybe there are sharks in the deep end. I've always had this very vivid imagination. And the guy I was talking to looked at me and said, Michael, I've been in the deep end for 14 years and I haven't drowned and I haven't been eaten by sharks. But if you stay in the shallow end of the pool of life, you'll only ever experience this much of it. And I went, went away, and we were camping um, on a mountain called Mount Olympus. And we were on, I climbed up to, more or less up to the top, and I chain-smoked my way through 40 cigarettes, thinking, can I do this or not? Came down off the mountaintop, went to a group of friends, who were not Christians as well, and I said to them, I'm going to pray with these guys and ask them and asked to become a Christian tonight, from now on, I won't be enjoying life. That's, exa that's exactly what I said. And uh, when I found these guys, I said, you have to pray with me. And they prayed with me, and my life just completely changed. Um, I knew that I was simply not the person I was before, but I didn't know how to explain it. So my, what I decided I'd do is I'll tell no one. And so after that, I thought, right, until I'm, I, I can clearly explain what happened to me, I won't tell anyone. And that didn't work. Because as soon as I got back, everyone I okay. met looked at me and said, what's happened to you? You're different. And I, I, I can remember um, this, meeting this one girl in particular. And I'd been a Christian for two days, and she was a model. And I'd unsuccessfully been trying to seduce her for a while. And uh, one of the reasons why I was convinced that my life would be less happy as a Christian yes. was that God might change that area of my life. I didn't want to mess up around with that. And I can remember she said, you've changed. What's happened to you? And I said, I don't think I can explain it. And she said, try. So I said, well, yesterday I became a Christian. And she said, well, what does that mean? I said, I'm not sure. All I know is I'm not the person I was before. Yes. And then she looked at me point blank and she said, do you want to sleep with me? I can remember looking at her saying, if you asked me two days ago, um, the answer would have been yes. I said, but today the answer is no. And the thing that surprised me was I wasn't disappointed with my answer. And so... At the point of becoming a Christian, I thought, I'm in danger of being a hypocrite, or if I keep the rules of being miserable. And after I became a Christian, the first thing that really surprised me, after the initial joy of coming to know Christ, was then thinking, actually, I've just said no, and I'm not disappointed. Sure. I've got something bigger and greater and grander than this in my life now. And it, it changed everything. From there, you went off to university. You did yes. law first, yeah. then you ended and up... And then I got interested in law and economics. I... Gosh, so without being overly technical, um, in the early 1990s, England was part of something called the exchange rate mechanism, and it was a way of controlling currencies. And there were these things called derivatives that people were yes. using for currency speculation, and I got very interested in this, and I thought, I would like to research into this in detail. 
And I spent all these years re researching it. And as a matter of fact, my wife might be able to remember once coming into the room. And she said, you look so depressed. And I remember bursting into tears and just saying, we're going to have a huge collapse of the financial system. And um, so I got very, very interested in law and economics and how the financial system works. And, and when I first started my ministry, I used to give this talk about there'll be a collapse of the financial system. And then I, I stopped giving it in the early 2000s. And then when everything went wrong in the sort of 07, 08, all of a sudden I started getting these invitations from bankers, um, some quite senior bankers yes. saying, I remember you saying 10 years ago this was going to happen. Um, why didn't you come and explain to us what, what's going on? So now part of what I do about as I travel is speaking yes. banks. So after you did your PhD, yeah. you then um, started engaging in apologetics. Yeah, well, I think as a law... When I went to university, I'd been given these tapes, as I say, by this guy, Ravi Zacharias. And as a new Christian, I went to church in this Anglican cathedral. And from day one, the guy who was speaking to me didn't seem to know who Jesus was. That was clear. But I knew I wanted to come to church and worship and sing. So I'll be there enthusiastically worshipping, singing away... And then listening to this guy, trying to think, I wonder what you think, what you ought to be saying. And then someone gave me these tapes by this guy called Ravi Zacharias, who you know, yes. and some of your viewers may have heard him. And I put a tape in, pressed play, and went, oh, this is obviously what Christians do. Yes. Because I had nothing to compare it to. I hadn't heard any other pre Christian preacher before. So I thought, oh, I better start studying. You know, this guy knows a lot. And so I used to play those cassettes and write them out by hand with, pen and pe with a pencil and paper. And then I memorised them. So after I'd been about a Christian for a year and a half, a church asked me to come and speak, and I took one of his messages and removed all references to his wife and children because I was an unmarried, <laughs> yes. unmarried and had no kids. And gave the talk. And preached it. Yes. Well, I, I, as I walked out, I, I remember one old lady saying to another old lady, he's only been a Christian for one and a half years, but he knows so much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And... and that, if you like, sort of set my heart on fire. Sure. And I think, also for me, in the nine months before I became a Christian, every week I met with Christians and asked them difficult questions. So much so that the guy leading the group took me aside one day and said, look, when I say, does anyone have a question, do you mind waiting for a little <laughs> bit to see if anyone else has a question and then I'll call on you? And so I used to sit sometimes out of his line of sight and he'll say, anyone have a question? And then after you know, a pause or something, he'll say, sure. Michael... You know, and then I'll just jump in. And after I became a Christian, I remember thinking, I want to give people the opportunity that I was given. Is it true? Is it real? I want them to be able to ask those questions, bring their objections, bring their complaints, sure. but bring their issues, and I'll try and, you know... Well, let's ask some them. now. OK, <laughs> so let's start with uh, the word God. What yes. does that mean? Do you have any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> You know, my, um, my boss, Ravi Zacharias, he, when he was doing his theology exam, one of the questions was, define, um, God is perfect, explain. That yes. was the question. And he looked at it and he thought, the only more difficult question I can think of would be, define God and give two, answers, and give two, give two, give two examples. Yes. Um, actually, it's a really, really important question. Yes. For two, for two reasons. One... Ever since Christians started preaching the gospel, that question's been asked. So when Paul was preaching in Athens, he uses a very controversial word, theos, for God, which the Jew Jewish converts to Christianity didn't like. And the reason it was controversial was the Greek word theos referred to a group of gods who slept with each other, they killed each other, you know, they deceived each other, they lied, they cheated, they stealed. I mean, basically, they were the soap opera of the time. So you know, like, everyone likes watching soap operas yes. because yes. You know, they want to know the intrigue about all the bad things that are going on. Well, that's what the, what the gods were like. And so the early Jewish believers in Christ, the early Messianic Jews, said, you can't use this Greek word theos to talk about the one true holy God whose name we're scared to take on our lips in case we accidentally blaspheme. You can't use that word. But Paul, he had to use that word, but then he had to define it, which is what he does. But this God, this theos, isn't like, you know... Gods that are served by human hands, and he doesn't need anything. So he, he has to use the word, and then he has to define it. Now, why is that so important today? Well, let's take what's happening with new atheism right now, and that looks yes. like the God delusion. Well, the argument goes like this. Look, we have created the gods because we need them, but we, we need to get rid of them. 
Now, the funny thing is, as a Christian, I agree with that. I think all created gods are idols, and I don't believe in them. But Richard Dawkins didn't write the created god delusion. He wrote the god delusion. But for him, all gods are created. Does that make sense? And I would say, I think all gods are created, apart from one. So the first question comes, what do we mean by the word God? Yes. And part of the answer is, well, he's always existed. I, I remember being a law student and a student saying to me once, so who created God? And I said, I don't understand the question. And because, you know, olive skin, you know, he, he spoke a foreign language in the way a lot of English people do. He slowed down and shouted a bit more loudly and said, my question is, who created God? I said, I still don't understand the question. And now he looked really worried. He said, why don't you understand my question? I said, well, look, it's simple. You're asking the question about God, who by definition has always existed. There was never a time he didn't exist. But then you say, who created? Which means there was a time he didn't exist and had to be brought into existence. So your question is, when did the God who always exists, there was never a time he didn't exist, when didn't he exist and had to be brought into existence? So it doesn't make any sense. He actually became a Christian, believe it or not, after that. Answer. Um, <laughs> So this is really important. First thing is, is that we're not talking about a God that came to be. It's God is, is eternal. He's always been there. And maybe the next most important thing then to say is, and he's revealed perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that that's true, that particular statement? That God is revealed in the person in of Christ. Jesus. How do we know that? Yeah, it's a very bold claim, isn't it? Um, I mean, there's that classic story, you must know it, about the psychiatrist who gets transferred from one ward to another yes. and he's doing the rounds. And he says to this guy in one of the psychiatric beds, who are you? And he says, I'm Napoleon. And he says, who told you you're Napoleon? He says, God told me. And the guy in the bed next to him said, I did not. <laughs> um, so the, the yeah. issue is, is, is when someone saying, I am mm. God, is not, you know, it's not difficult. You know, anyone can say those three words. The question is, how do you meaningfully sustain that? How do you know? Now, as Christians, we actually have lots of answers to that. Um, one is to do, let's start on the more, what someone might call the more spiritual end. Let's start with prophecy. The amazing thing about prophecy is it doesn't simply tell you what happens before it happens. It also tells you why something will happen before it happens. So I, I was having dinner at a wedding. I'm sure you've been to lots of weddings. And you know you always get stuck with people you don't know. So I meet, meet this guy, I've never met him before. What's your name? What do you do? And he tells me, he says, I teach history. And he was at Cambridge University and had just moved to another university, I think in Wales. I said, ooh, what kind of history do you teach? He said, I teach postmodern Spanish history. And I said, well, what's that? He said, nobody can tell you what history means. When you read a history book, you're not reading what about what happened. You're reading about what the historian wanted to happen. The historian imposes their interpretation on the facts. And they use whatever interpretation they want to. So when you read a history book, you don't know what happened 100 years ago. You only hear what the historian wants you to believe happened 100 years ago. History is whatever the historian makes it. And I said, that's an amazing idea. Is this hmm. an exam course at Cambridge? And his face fell. He said, well, it used to be, but students wrote whatever they wanted to in the exam. <laughs> And I said, well, that would appear to be consistent with what you're teaching them, wouldn't it be? Um, and, but I understand the problem. Does that make yes. sense? Whenever something happens, the first question is, what does it mean? Who can interpret f these facts authoritatively? And the beautiful thing about prophecy is it doesn't simply tell you what happens before it happens. It explains why. The interpretation is given before the event. So when the event takes place, you don't have to sit around saying, ooh, what does this mean? Again. You recognize the chain of events, the interpretation which has been given. So one of the things that Jesus did was the fulfillment of all of this prophecy. And there are hundreds of them. Um, so, so, but if Jesus did fulfil yeah. all of the prophecies Prophecy. in the Old Testament, yeah. why didn't the Jewish nation accept that? Well, some did. I mean, most people forget that all the early believers were Jews. And Pentecost, the first Pentecost, when Holy Spirit, was a Jewish event. Everybody who was there for that feast would have been Jewish. But the Jewish people also nailed so him to a cross. So some accepted and some didn't. So why, didn't, why were there so many people that didn't believe? Well, I think the answer to that then, then moves in now into a whole other area. You know, when I shared my testimony, I said, I didn't want it to be true. Yes. Sometimes we don't want things to be true, even if they are. 
So there's a great story in the life of Jesus in, in the Gospel of Luke where there's this guy, Lazarus, and he's dead. I've heard a really great sermon preached on it by a guy called J. John. You should listen to it sometime. He does this great <laughs> embodiment of Lazarus coming out of the tomb. He acts out the whole thing. It's fascinating. And, but So Lazarus is dead. Jesus raises him from the dead. Right? What would you expect the reaction to be? Well, you would expect at least sort of, wow. Absolutely. Amazing. This is incredible. That resurrection is reported back and the people who hear the report say this is getting us nowhere if we allow him to keep doing miracles like this everyone will go after him we have to and from that day on they plotted out to kill him now isn't that interesting they don't deny the reality of the resurrection that just took place there's no question jesus raised lazarus from the dead we believe it but if we don't kill him people will believe him that makes sense so sometimes the beliefs we have we hold on to them so strongly that even when truth comes, we may not be prepared to, to accept it. So Jesus is the fulfillment of, of all the so messianic we have, prophecies. So, so we have that. Um, then we also have um, uh, how Jesus himself claimed to authenticate his ministry you know, through miracles, and, which is, word means sign. Um, then we have, um, I would actually say, we have lots of other evidence. I think you can make a vet both, um, we won't bore you with philosophy, but I think whether you want to go philosophically, scientifically, historically, archaeologically, prophetically, I think there are lots of lines you can say, well, is Jesus, was he real? Is, who did he claim to be? Did he actually rise from the dead? Is this, is this true? But before I became a Christian, um, we were asked to go and look into the resurrection. And because I wanted to do a law degree, I thought, yeah. oh, I have an evidence argument. And we went away for two weeks and we came back and we all made presentations. See, and you know, I think they were expecting me as a non-Christian to give a presentation saying this never happened. And so I basically said, look, I've looked at this. I think there are seven different possible explanations here. I've looked into all of them. None of them make any sense. The resurrection is the only credible explanation. And you presented this as someone who wasn't a believer. Yeah, and I think they all looked at me expecting me to become a Christian. And I just said, it's very unusual, but obviously it happened. But it didn't actually change me at that point. And actually, interestingly, later on, I discovered C.S. Lewis had a very similar incident in his life. When C.S. Lewis was at Oxford and as a professor, he felt he was in danger of being converted. So he went and found a professor of ancient history who, in C.S. Lewis's words, were, who was the most secure atheist he knew. And he went to this guy thinking that one good conversation with this really secure atheist will save me from being converted. And they're sitting there in this professor's study, port, pipes, fire... You know, very Oxford scene. Yes. In silence. And then the, this professor of ancient history, he takes the pipe out of his mouth and he says, rum thing, Lewis, looks like that resurrection thing might actually have happened. Puts the pipe back into his mouth. <laughs> and Lewis says he walked out of that room absolutely despondent, saying, if the most secure atheist I know at Oxford has concluded, that, you know, what hope is there for me? And it was sh le shortly later after that, you have that famous line about, you know, he got, knelt down in yes. his study and allowed God to be God, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Because yes. he didn't want it to be true, but the evidence piled up so strongly against it. So prophecies fulfilled. fulfilled. Pro yeah, prophecies the fulfilled. resurrection. Histori his history, the yes. resurrection. Um, w uh, now, now, which so, authenticates, which authenticates what, he said, what, what he said and did. Now we come into some other interesting areas. Um, Let's take questions like, why are we here? Why are we here? <laughs> well, you invited me. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, so you, you have... Now, we've asked questions, and there are two ways of answer, answering that question. One is to say, that's a stupid question. And sadly, we live in a world right now where people think that's the wrong question to be asking. Now, some scientists at the moment seem to be arguing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good explanations are scientific explanations, but science doesn't deal with why, it only deals with what and how. And as soon as you go beyond that, you're into like speculation, and no, there are no good answers at that point. Um, now that doesn't, that's a bad line of argument. So let's suppose I walk into your kitchen, the kettle's boiling, and I say, John, why is the kettle boiling? And you say, well, Michael, the burning gas is generating 
energy in the form of heat. It's being transferred through the metal base of the pan, okay, through a process of conduction. That's being then conducted into the water, agitating the molecules. As the amount of energy held amongst those molecules increases, eventually it moves from being liquid into a gas, and that's why it's boiling. Or I could say, we're making a cup of tea. Or you could say, I'm making a cup of tea. <laughs> now, if I came to you and said, you can't have both of those explanations, you only can have one, you have to choose, well, that's a very bad, because they're both, they're both, they're both true. true. They're both true. So, um, but if you buy into the idea that, look, you can't ever go into the whys of this world, you know, you can't even go there. Does that make sense? You cut off one whole line of inquiry that's actually led many scientists to believe in God. I mean, a really good friend of mine at Oxford who's the director of postgraduate theoretical physics at the University of Oxford. I mean, that's an impressive yes. title. You know, he's a very strong believer. I mean, there are some YouTube videos of him on YouTube explaining why, as a theoretical physicist at Oxford, he believes in miracles and Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Um, so we are going to have to overcome this idea. It's that science sure. is somehow... That's not true. As a matter of fact, science raises some interesting questions. Now, we have to be really careful here. It's, um, but even if we say science doesn't prove God, science raises some really, really, really interesting questions. Yes, it does. And, and one of the most famous atheists in England, you mean you probably know this story, Anthony Flew. Yeah. He he changed his mind. A a Anthony Flew was a professor. Yeah. Um, uh, he's a philosopher. He argued for decades against the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, when yeah. he was a student at Oxford University, he debated C.S. Lewis and yeah. was considered to have won that debate. He actually won it. And. Afterwards, he wrote an academic article, because he won this debate against C.S. Lewis, called Theology and Falsification, which was the most widely reprinted theology, uh, philosophy essay of the 20th century. So he was a pretty well-known philosopher. And he did a series of debates in his life. And I remember meeting him about six, nine months before he died. And he said, I've always been interested in the truth. That's the only thing that's ever interested me. And I always argued against God because I believed it wasn't true. But he went through a series of debates that began to change him. He did one debate, famous debate, on the resurrection, arguing you can't know whether it's true or false. And he lost it, and he knew he lost it. And he got thinking, well, what happens if it's true? And then he, he had another very famous debate where, have you ever heard the line, if you give enough monkeys typewriters, they produce the works of Shakespeare? Yeah. Have you ever heard that? Yes. Anthony Flew popularised that line. Right. That was him. Have you ever, have you, I don't know if the audience yes. is. It's, a very, yes, it's it very, well known. It very, is. very well known. It's very, very well known. Yes. Anyway, someone actually did an experiment where they put a keyboard in a cage with six monkeys for three months to see what would happen. Now, apart from using it as a toilet, <laughs> the monkeys produced six typed pages, but not one single word, which is all the more amazing when you consider the shortest word in the English language is A or I. Yes. And this got him thinking... Forget about the works of Shakespeare. This is what Flew said. He said, what about producing one Shakespearean sonnet, just one? Now, all Shakespearean sonnets are 14 lines long. He picked, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? What is the chance, using a standard keyboard, of getting all the syntax and everything right in that? So he did some maths. It's quite simple maths. But the answer is amazing. The chance of randomly getting one Shakespearean sonnet, by chance, is one divided by one with 690 zeros after it. So it, now, doesn't, I, it doesn't happen every day. No. <laughs> and, and, and unless you're a banker, yeah. you don't know how big a number that is. No. <laughs> so let me try to explain how big that number is. If you were to take everything in the universe, everything, okay, you, me, these chairs, this set, this world, this solar system, every solar system, every galaxy, every star, everything, and you were to count every proton, neutron, and electron in the known universe, at the time this illustration was first given, the answer would be there will be one with 80 zeros after it particles in the universe. Does that make sense? It does. But the universe would have to be one with 600 times zeros after it bigger than it is just to randomly write down the trials. Or, how about this? Let's suppose you took the entire universe, everything that exists, all of it, and you convert all of it into microchips. Each microchip weighs one millionth of a gram. Each microchip, one million times a second, randomly produces enough characters 
to write, shall I compare these to a summer's day? So one million times a second, they randomly generate the 288 characters required for that sonnet, and let's assume that those microchips have been running since time itself began. Well, by today, you would have produced 10 to the power of 90 trials. That's one with 90 zeros after it. The universe would have to be one with 600 zeros after it, times older than it is, on that basis to make one Shakespearean sonnet. Which proves... <laughs> Which proves... So when, when Anthony Flew saw this, he said, life is much harder to generate than a Shakespearean sonnet. Yes. So... The idea that monkeys can somehow do it every time is amazing. So at this point, he began to conclude, there must be a mind behind this universe. There has to be some kind of intellect. And indeed, actually, quite a few well-known atheists have said, well, very famously, one prize-winning physicist said, it looks like a superior intellect has monkeyed with the laws of physics. In a sense, in other words, Absolutely. he's interfered. Yes. So now that doesn't necessarily prove anything, but what it does is it starts asking questions. Why? This is amazing. What, what, how is this all possible? And, um, now, now, but and even in a place like Oxford, it's interesting, a lot of people becoming Christians because of being driven by, being driven by questions like that. Now, obviously, you, you quoted the Messianic prophecies, yeah. you talked about the resurrection. That's recorded in yeah. the Bible. Yeah. But how do we know the Bible's true? <laughs> well, it is true that if you step outside of the Bible there's only a limited amount of evidence about who Jesus Christ is. Yes. A guy called Professor John Dixon in Australia has written a great little book you know, dealing with some of this it's fairly bang up to date. You can easily find him if you want to. So if you discard the Bible, all you can find out about Jesus Christ, and it is a skeletal picture, is who his parents were, where he was born, when he was born, what his name was, that it was reported he did miracles, that he claimed to be God, that he was crucified, it was alleged that he was resurrected and the early Christians worshipped him as God and he promised to come back to judge the living and the dead. So if you take the Bible aside, all you can get about Jesus is that. Yes. You've got historical facts from people like Josephus and others Yeah, like that's that. right. So you've got all, all of that and the fact that he was worshipped. Now, here's what has changed a little bit over time. Um, <laughs> there used to be an argument and it went like this. You've got Jesus over here. He's a nice person. He says nice things. Nice people like him, but he gets killed. The nice people who like Jesus go telling other people, ooh, you should like Jesus too, but it doesn't really work. So then, a little bit later, they say, Jesus was a miracle worker, and you should really listen to him, because God approved of him. And then they say, by the way, he was God. Does that make sense? So the idea is, you've got Jesus, and then the story gets bigger and bigger Absolutely. and bigger and bigger magnified. like that. Except... <laughs> that doesn't seem to fit archaeology anymore. So from what we now can deduce from archaeology and history, and the very earliest manuscripts we have is this. And it's interesting, one of the guys who heads up something called the Jesus Seminar. Um, so the yes. Jesus Seminar is a very sceptical group. So what the Jesus Seminar basically said was, let's take all the sayings of Jesus and vote on them. So you know you get a Bible, some yep. of them have red letters yep. in it, right? So they said, let's take all the red letter sayings of Jesus and we'll vote. And they used little balls. Do, we'll take every sentence Jesus said and we'll vote on it. We'll all vote with a red ball if we think he's def definitely said it. We'll vote with a pink ball if we think he may have said it. And we'll vote with a black ball if he didn't say it. And they concluded that the Bible's so unreliable that you can't trust what, anything that Jesus was saying, more or less. Now, the same group who did that research... A couple of years ago, one of the guys leading it said, within two weeks of the alleged resurrection, now how we get the two weeks exactly is, I'd like to see, but he says within two weeks of the alleged resurrection, the, 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 the Jesus the disciples worshipped, they worshipped him as God, as crucified, and as raised from the dead. Now what does that mean? Now, it doesn't make it true, but what it means is the church hasn't changed the message. Does that make sense? Yeah, the message Jesus was worshipped as God, who was crucified and raised from the dead, right at the very beginning. And that's exactly what you read in the Bible. Now, to be fair to him, he still thinks what the Bible says is wrong. But the key thing is, it, it hasn't been changed. This idea that Jesus was a nice guy, they tried to persuade people about him, then they made up stories about miracles, then they claimed that he said he was God. That's not true. To argue that academically today 
is exceedingly difficult. Most historical theologians have moved away from it. Instead, what they said is the church worshipped Jesus Christ as God from day one. They believed he'd been crucified from day one and he'd raised to life, been raised to life from the dead from day one. So this is the message the church has always had and this is what we believe. So, so the authenticity and the authority of the scriptures are... Well, so what is interesting is that there are two different ways of dealing with the Bible, right? One is to say it's been changed, so you can't trust it. And a lot of people watching this programme, they would have been raised in a culture which would have said, it's been changed, you can't trust it. Yes. The debate's moving now to, it hasn't been changed, okay? but it's wrong. Does that make sense? In other words, yep. you, you, the Bible's actually, sure. the message is the same. So the question is then, we would then say, well, look, actually, it hasn't changed because it relates to what actually, what actually happened. This did actually happen. The bare bones archaeology, Jesus' life, death, the fact he claimed to rise, the, all of that's recorded there. And maybe, these, maybe this Bible's more reliable than you think. When I was a young student, I got given a book, and it was a very old book, written about 100 years ago. I bought it secondhand. Uh, sorry, I picked it up secondhand because um, someone told me about it, and it had within it 2,000 alleged contradictions in the Bible, things you couldn't trust. There was a piece of research done about 100 years after that looking at those 2,000, and they reduced it to 28. Now, that's not bad going, is it? Most of the evidence, every time we discover something, it seems to make the Bible more and more trustworthy. Does that make sense? It does. There's more but weight people, behind it. People obviously magnify these things and, uh, you know, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions and <laughs> use that statement as a way of dismissing it. Yeah. It's not full of contradictions. I'll give you a, a really, a really well-known example. You know, when Paul, Saul, is converted on the road to Damascus, he tells, tells that story three times in the book of Acts. And in one point, it sounds like he says that the crowd heard the voice from heaven. Okay? And in another part of the story, it sounds like they didn't hear the voice from heaven. Does that make sense? Yes. And the question is, well, that's a blatant contradiction. Yeah. D did the crowd hear or didn't they hear? There's a difference in the grammar. And what it means is, um, it's the equivalent in English would be like this. Let's suppose we're talking on the phone. And I were to say to you, John, I can't hear you because you're muffled. Yes. Now, I'm, the, the reason I'm going to say that is that if I were to say to you, John, I don't understand you, you would say, well, I'll speak more slowly then. Michael's thicker than I thought he was. <laughs> right? But the reason is, when I say I can't hear you, I don't mean I can't hear anything. I mean I can't distinguish the words. Yes. And when you actually look so very carefully, understand. I can't understand. Yes. And when you look very carefully what's going on, let's say, in that particular instance, in one case it's very clear that they didn't... They didn't understand. And in the other one, you know, a more technical translation would be, look, they heard, but they couldn't make it out. So actually, the alleged contradiction is just resolved by a better understanding of the grammar. Does that? Absolutely. And actually, there are loads of examples like that. Yeah. So you, you personally, having studied and researched yeah. this, you are convinced that the Bible is, true. is authentic and true and reliable. Yeah. yeah, and I met the author, which was helpful. Which makes a difference. Which makes a difference. Right, okay. So, <laughs> so in the beginning, God. Why did God make people? Why? Why did he make Adam and Eve? Are you asking me questions you know the answers to? Well, I want to know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he make Adam and Eve? Oh, wow. I can tell you, well, let's start off with a, an explanation that's a really bad one. Uh, when my... When my daughter was born, my first daughter, she was given a lot of books um, because people knew I liked books. And one of them was called Someone to Love. And the story went like this. There was this God. He was all alone. And um, so one day he decided to do something about it. And he created a beautiful blue and green planet and he had people on it. And now at last he had someone to love. Now... I didn't put this book aside lightly. I threw it with great force, and it went straight into the bin. Now, it's true, if you are a strict monotheist, God is one. It's true. That means that God is cosmically lonely before he creates other people, because 
You need two people to experience love and friendship. Okay. I mean, I know some people look in the mirror and go, oh, I'm in love, but that's sad. Yes. Yeah. You yes. Need, you need at least two. Yes. It's a personal quality. So, so was God lonely? Right. So the question is, was God lonely? Is that why he created it? And the answer yeah. is no, because God is also Trinity. Three persons, one Godhead. God exists in a set of, levi- in a set of living, loving relationships. He All doesn't right. create All right, we'll come back to Adam and Eve. Right, so Trinity. Three gods? How does that work? <laughs> We're doing the easy ones today. All right, let's go Trinity okay, well, then. Okay, well, God the Father, God, God the, the Son, Son, God the God Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. But Christians say it's one God. Yes, and not three. Not three. Yeah. But it, it sounds like three. Yes, that's right. And the answer is no. Is... Um, <laughs> okay, well... Again, there's actually an answer contained within the scripture itself. Um, In the Bible, it talks about when a man and a woman get married, the two become one. Now, that doesn't mean that when I got married, I became my wife and then got confused about my gender. (laughs) What it means is, well, the, the, the the language the Bible uses is one person, male, and one person, female, so it's like two personal things, become one thing. And... Again, in the grammar, if, you, if you're into, in, into this kind of thing, it's in what's called a neuter plural, which refers normally to a thing as opposed to... Um, so, like, one essence. Does that make sense? We yes. become one. It doesn't mean that they're, 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 we're not now two people, but there are two people in one... joined together in one essence, one marriage. Same grammatical structures used for the life of the church. There are many members of the body, you know, personal... Pronouns are used to talk about these members of the body, but we are one church, one essence, one thing. And exactly the same language is used when Jesus says, the Father and I are one. He uses the word Father, which is a, it's a personal use of a word, talking about himself, also personal. But the word one there in Greek is also in the neuter. Okay? One thing, one essence, one. So we don't believe in three gods, in a sense. We believe in there is one Godhead, one thing, one essence. And within that, there are three persons who live in a set of living, loving relationships. So, rather than it happening to be the case that God has to create life in order to experience love, God is love, and out of love, he creates life. He doesn't need us. So the reason why God created us, going back to the Adam and Eve, is he didn't need to create us to experience love. He is love, and out of love, he creates life. Now, it's true that in maybe some other religious systems, God has to create people to have someone to love. That makes him cosmically lonely, but that doesn't sound very godlike to me. That's one of the reasons why I love the Trinity. It's, it's, a lot of Christians feel that's a problematic area, but actually it makes sense of so many other things if you actually think about it. And so then why does God create? And the answer seems to be what well, he creates out of love because he wanted to. Okay, but Revelation did... 4.11, by his will we were and were are created. Why are you here? Well, because God wants you to be here. He wanted John. And he wanted everyone who's watching this program. So if you live in a relatively big country, the chances are, if you've got a job, you're paying taxes. And if you're a taxpayer, you should be supporting this ministry, obviously. And, um, but as far as the government is concerned, you're just a number on a piece of paper normally. Yes. The but government isn't that bothered about whether you exist or not. And if you work for a big company, the chance that the chairman knows who you are is quite small, unless you own the company. But, but God knows every single one of us, and he actually wants us okay. to be oh, here. Michael, a woman, he is, you. a woman is raped. Yeah. She has a baby. Right. Why would God allow um, that to happen, gosh. to bring about one of his created beings? Yeah. Why didn't he strike the man yeah. when he was about to rape the woman? Now, I think you're asking me one of the most difficult questions I think you can be asked. Um, I think there's a difference between... There's a very, in the play Macbeth, you know, with Shakespeare, there's this very interesting thing that happens, right? Where a prophecy is given, and then someone acts and does something which is wrong to try to bring it about. Yes, yeah. And actually, in the Bible, we also have instances, especially in the Old Testament, where prophecies are given, and then people use them to bring something about which is then wrong. So there are... A difference between means and ends, and God is interested in both. So it's one thing to say, God wanted this person to be, and another thing to say, he approves of all the means by which they came to be. Is it possible okay, that, out, that if this crime and sin had not been committed, the se- this person could have, would have come to be through some other means? And the answer is, well, yes. 
Okay? So just by the fact that we step in and try to mess up, for me, what it means is that when we commit these crimes and when we do these terrible things and when we go against what God would have us do and we will be punished for it, which is very interesting because a lot of people don't like talking about God's punishment anymore. But if you've suffered a horrendous crime and you have to live with the thought that the person who did it will get away with it, that's soul-destroying. But if you know there will be a time yeah. when justice will be done, well, that, that can change everything. So, so my question would be, I think, so part of my question, I think it's a very deep question, but a much bigger answer would sure. be, look, God wants us, he actually loves us, but the means by which may have been employed by different people in different ways may be wrong. But even though when we're trying to work against God and we're doing things which are wrong and we shouldn't be doing, does that make sense? Our rebellion isn't big enough to throw him off course. But God is in control. Yeah. So why doesn't he just come in and ban? And, well, we'll put it this yeah. way. Look, Michael, <laughs> there are some uh, loving husbands and wives yeah. yes. in, a, in wonderful relationships yeah. who would desperately love to have a baby yeah. and unable to. Two. Yeah. And a girl gets raped yeah. and gets pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. So, well, if God knows all this, yeah. why didn't he prevent the one and allow the loving couple to have a baby? Yeah, that's a really, really... I mean, uh, th these are, I mean, these are huge questions which are going to take more than just a couple of minutes to answer. I th the nearest I could get to understanding part of what's going on in this world is that what we're also told is the world we live in is broken is fallen. The world we see now is not the way the world always was when it was first created, nor is it the way that it will always be. We live in a fallen and broken world. Now, what is interesting is, um, just to sort of maybe just to change, move the track just very slightly, sure. then we can come back to it. After the tsunami, yes. the Oxford Union said, would I come and speak to them? Now, the Oxford Union are a very famous debating society yeah, in Oxford. Yes. You know, and, they, and one of the things they pride themselves on is being rude to their guests. You know, so they'll invite the Dalai Lama in and then they'll start thinking, who can ask him the rudest and most embarrassing question? So it's the kind of thing where you think, oh, I'm delighted to be asked, Sure. do I want to go? Um, so I said, okay, I will come. And they sent me the title. And the title was God and the Tsunami. And I wrote back to them saying, look, I... The only reason I'm nervous about the title is that hundreds of thousands of people have just died. Yes. And you want to pull a crowd on the back of that. I said, and I just feel a bit uncomfortable. Could we talk about God of love, world of suffering? Yeah. And I promise you, in the context of that talk, I'll speak about it. Mm. And they said, that's fine. And as I was writing the talk, I'm sure you've had this experience, yeah, yeah. I, there was one line I kept thinking, shall I put it in or shall I take it out? And I kept, every time I sort of ran through it, I put it in, then I took it out, I put it in, I took it out. In the end, I had it in my notes with a big red ring around it and a question mark, thinking, do I even want to go there? So at the end of the talk, in which I tried to explain why it may be that we, God created a world that was great, but has now fallen and is broken, I then said, look, you may, let's suppose you agreed with everything I said. This loving God creates a perfect world. He puts us in it. We rebel against him. This world is broken. We are broken. Everything's going wrong. You might say to me, Michael, even if you believe that, when you see something like the tsunami, doesn't it make you disbelieve God? Doesn't it make you question him? And I said, now that would be a really legitimate question. And I would question God if I felt I saw things happening in this world that God said wouldn't happen. But they did. Yes. But when I see something happen in this world that God said would happen, and it does, it doesn't cause me to question him, but it causes me to question, what does this mean? In Luke 21, Jesus said there would come a time when the nations, in the plural, would be appalled at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Now, that's an interesting line. Normally, sure. captains of boats are appalled yes. at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Not nations in the plural. Yeah. I said, so when I see things like this happen, it doesn't cause me to question him, but it asks me to question, what does this mean? Yes. And I then stopped there and said, let's have questions. And I was expecting, the reason I kept putting this line in there, I was expecting to be mauled. And there was silence for about 30 seconds. I don't know if you've ever stood in front of an audience yeah, and said, yeah, right, yeah, who yeah. wants to ask me a question? Yes. No one wants to ask. 30 seconds feels like hours. And then the first question came up, and the guy said, well, 
what should we do then about the mess that mm. we've brought into this world through our rebellion? And my heart sank because I talked to the mm. Christians beforehand and I said, look, please don't ask me questions. Yes. Okay, I don't want Christians asking me questions. I'd love non-Christians to be asking their questions. So don't jump in. Even if there's a, a gap, don't just, just leave it so that we can... So I thought, oh, you know, Christians jumped in. So I answered this question really simply, turned my back on him and said, how about over here? Someone want to ask a question over here? Anyway, this guy was one of the student leaders at the university at the time, and he wasn't a believer. Mm. Um, yeah. So the question you're, part of the question you're asking me is there are lots of p- components to it. One, when I see terrible things in the world, does it cause me to question God? And the answer is, well, the, the world that's described to me in the Bible is a broken world. God created a beautiful and perfect world, and it, has, it is broken. We've rebelled against All kinds of things are going wrong. And I'm told that they'll go wrong. So when I see it, it doesn't cause me to question it. Now, the next question is, which I guess is linked, is, well, what's God doing about this? Um, and, and maybe there are two parts to that. I don't know. Is, do you play computer no, games? I don't, actually. Don't you? Well... Backgammon. <laughs> that doesn't count. No. But... If you did play computer games, yes. If you talk to anyone who plays computer games a lot, if they mess up at the beginning, right at the beginning of a game they love playing, what they normally do is they hit reset. For instance, I'll start over. I'll start over again. Okay. When everything went wrong, God could have hit reset and started over again. Okay. Did God know it was all going to go wrong? Ah. <laughs> These are all the easy questions I'm getting tonight. And these are the questions you put to all your other guests. I should have watched the other videos to get the answers. Mm. Well, did he know that I, he, he, they were going to fall and the world was going to get dislocated? Did he know that? I think he did. Why did he allow it? Right. OK. Going back into Revelation again, there's, there's this very interesting line where it talks about before the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain. Now, there's a really interesting line. What does that mean? Because obviously the Lamb, Jesus Christ, was slain, the cross, before the foundation of the world. So it doesn't mean there were two crucifixions. God thought, hmm, this might go wrong. Let's kill Jesus and see what happens. Ooh, that's really effective. Okay, let's go ahead and create the world. (laughs) I don't think that's what it means. I think what that means is before God created, he knew it would go wrong. And he knew what it would cost to rescue him, to rescue this world. He knew what it would cost him. Now, I mean, th- th- this is my wedding ring. You know, someone said who gave it to me, this is a small band of metal that cuts off your circulation. <laughs> so, now this has value to me. And one of the ways you'll measure the value is by the price I'm prepared to pay for it, right? Now, if, if I tried to sell this and not a single person in the world wanted to buy it, its economic value would be zero. Does that make sense? The yes. value is determined by the price you're prepared to pay. The price that God was prepared to pay to rescue this world was the highest possible price he could have paid. If God exists, gold doesn't mean anything to him. But God not only knew what would go wrong, he also knew what it would cost him to fix it. And the price he was prepared to pay was the highest possible price he could have paid. He gave himself in the person of Jesus Christ to rescue it from the point where it went wrong. Now what does that tell me? That tells me that the value he's put on bringing us into existence, knowing we will turn our back on him, knowing all of the pain that would will come as a result, and what it would cost him to rescue it, yet he still deems it worthy. It tells me something about the nature and the depth of God's love. It's a bit like, I, I have three kids. You have three boys. Three, three boys. I have and one two, daughter in law. I have two girls and a boy, and my 14 year old daughter, who's now five foot ten, I'm taking up gun training to protect her from, <laughs> from the world in which we live. Let, let's suppose that I knew the future, and before having my kids, I knew that they'll grow up to hate me, let's say. That, you know, despite happy childhood, when they got into their 20s, they would hate me with a passion and they would never speak to me again. They would cause unending heartache for me and my wife. They would disappoint us at every level. We would be unreconciled and I'll die in my bed. You know, whatever. Now, if I knew that was going to be the case, I wouldn't have them. Because by waiting a month, I could have a different baby. Now, if you don't know how that works, I, yeah. I can fix you up with someone. No, you can no, explain it to you. we've got it, we've got it, we've got right. it. Go on. That's because I'm not interested in that. Now, here's a question. I know it might be a bit, bit deep, but does it make God more loving or less loving? That he is willing to give existence 
to people, knowing that some of us will turn our back on him and be a cause of, un, of, of this pain. I mean, Jesus wept over the things that he saw. He, he, he mourned over Jerusalem. I have longed to gather you, he said, as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you weren't willing. Does it make him more loving or less loving? And I can't help but think it actually, it makes him, it actually makes him more loving. So the biblical picture of this is the God who is pleading with people to come back. You're, you're a, the director of a centre in Oxford called yeah. OCCA, yeah. which stands for... The Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. And you run courses. We have courses, that's true. Full time? We have, so you can, the way the centre is set up is you can actually come to Oxford University and do a one or two year course of study and, um, you know, uh, through them. And then the centre, we, uh, we provide uh, sort of the oversight, you know, uh, for, you know uh, for some of that which is going on there and some of the teaching. So it's a way of coming to a place where there are a lot of critics, a lot yes. of sceptics, yes. hearing some of the world's from hearing some of the world's best atheists, best agnostics, best skeptics, and also some of the world's leading Christian thinkers too, and wrestling with these things in a really deep way. Um, we also do a six-week program, which is just run by the centre itself, yes. for businessmen and women who want to find out what does it mean to be called into the place of work, what difference does God make there, how can I make him known, make him known there. Michael, it's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>